thank you very much for coming. I am absolutely astonished at the turnout. Um, so thank you very, very much for taking the time to come and join us at this first Drupal ACT meetup in over a year. Um, it's been a while. I'll admit from the outset that I don't live in Canberra. I live in Melbourne. I know, but I'm not from Sydney. So, um, so uh, I have a lot of clients in Canberra, so I was very interested in seeing that this event took place again and that the Canberra community was meeting up. Um, and I got the idea to get involved with this uh, when I met with two people who I work with that were both doing the same thing but totally disconnected from each other. And I just thought, you guys need a venue where you can meet and talk about all the cool stuff that you're doing. So uh, I want to say a huge thanks to Annex for hosting and thanks to Marge for all of the help that she's done on the ground. I've just been directing. Um, and so tonight uh, I'm going to do sort of a preview demonstration of a talk that I'm giving at DrupalCon Prague in the next three weeks. Um, and then Nathan Wall is going to give us an update on GovCMS and then we'll see where the evening takes us. Uh, I would also like at some point, there is no camera, I'm sorry. Oh, there, oh, there's a camera here. Um, so if you're waving, you're waving here. Um, uh, and um, we're really keen to probably do this every month or two months moving forward, obviously with Drupal South coming up. If you haven't heard, Drupal South is coming up in Brisbane on the 19th to 21st um, of October. Um, so grab your tickets for that. They're still relatively cheap at this point, early bird pricing and all of that. Um, and so yeah, early November, we're thinking about doing a panel. We don't know what the panel would be about, um, but if you have any suggestions, please let us know. And then early December, we're thinking about just going somewhere for drinks. Um, so without further ado, I will share my screen. And we'll get stuck into this presentation. I'll have a little bit of liquid courage. Are you going to be written to presentation? I had a little bit of an incentive. To, part of why this is good for me is that I, I, I had to have it ready early. Uh, the, the, the interesting test will be as if it's anything like this by the time it makes it to Prague. Oh, who's going to know? That's me. Everyone here. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so uh, yeah, my name is Michael Richardson. I run a managed Drupal platform as a service provider called Ironstar. We provide uh, managed Drupal hosting for state, federal, and local government, as well as enterprise clients in payment processing, aviation, uh, and another sector that I'm totally blanking on. But they're a very valuable client. Um, tonight, I'm going to be talking about uh, how business managers and project leaders can gain confidence in their site security. As a bit of a survey, who here would describe themselves as non-technical when it comes to Drupal? Okay, this talk, who here would describe themselves as a decision maker who is non-technical when it comes to Drupal? All right, this talk is for you. Uh, everyone else, uh, you are my guinea pigs because I'm sure all of you who are technically oriented and come from technical backgrounds have to encourage and guide non-technical decision makers in making technical decisions about your Drupal site. And this talk and this experience is really, it's based on an experience that I had about three years ago where I failed to correctly and effectively educate a non-technical decision maker on the merits of Drupal and specifically Drupal's security capabilities. Uh, I was asked by a client that we work with to get involved in a client of theirs. So this was an agency. Their client had about 12 sites that were hosted somewhere else. And those sites were having performance issues. Um, no one knew what was going on. And they asked us if we could get involved, do a bit of assessment, provide a report to the client with a set of recommendations. Pretty standard stuff. Uh, pretty quickly after getting in there, we found that they'd been hacked and that someone had put a crypto miner on both of their web servers and were just generating Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever it was, um, and no one was aware. We provided, we cleaned everything up, we did what we had to do, and then we provided a report to the chief marketing officer of that company. And her takeaway from that conversation was Drupal is insecure. 
And I don't know where in that conversation I went wrong, but I could not get back from that deduction that she had made. I tried very hard to explain that Drupal was not insecure. Her implementation of Drupal was insecure. But at the end of the day, the entire organization replatformed all 12 of their sites onto WordPress. So, uh, also very secure. That. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that was just failure to failure, really. Um, but uh, in, in my work, uh, I very often, almost daily, talk to non-technical decision makers who are responsible for very technical decisions. And I have a lot of empathy for them in that situation because they don't come from computer science background. They don't come from a programming background. They haven't built Drupal sites. They haven't hosted Drupal sites. And yet they're responsible for sites that generate, in some cases, millions and millions of dollars that are essential to the organizations that they work for. And they get asked to make these decisions that they don't have any real understanding of. But nonetheless, they are responsible and they are accountable. So um, that's I've gone through all of that and skipped that slide. So we'll move past that. Um, so yeah, this talk is about some of the things that you should be asking your teams about to secure your Drupal sites. Uh, we're going to talk about this from a cost benefits point of view. Not everybody has an unlimited security budget. If you have an unlimited security budget, please see me later on this evening. I have some stuff <laughs> I want to talk to you about. Um, but uh, really, not. there is no security solution that everybody should have. It's all risk and benefit and choosing what fits you. But there is a lot of stuff that you can do to your Drupal site that will make it very secure that I find in my experience, a lot of organizations and a lot of teams aren't doing. And this stuff is free or cheap, and most of the time, very, very easy. Um, so we'll start by talking about the easy wins. These are the things that are free and that are very, very simple to do, and that very few Drupal sites actually seem to have. Um, and the first one is security headers, using the security kit module. Um, I would imagine most of the technical hands that we saw earlier would be familiar with security kit and security headers. But for those of you who aren't, a header is something that your web server sends as metadata to anybody who's requesting any object. So when a user visits your site, they get a bunch of headers. The headers provide instructions to the browser. And security headers, in particular, provide security instructions uh, to explain, uh, I want you to always talk to me with SSL. I want you to do this to avoid cross-site request forgery or cross-site scripting, click jacking, all of that sort of stuff. Security headers are free. The security kit module is free. It is all very, very easy to set up. Um, and it does work. It provides quite a lot of uh, effective control against these sort of um, manipulation of users in real time against your, uh, with the browser that they're using against your site. Um, so we should be asking the question of our technical teams, do we have security kit? Are we doing, are we sending security headers with our site? And are we configuring them correctly to do things like prevent click checking across site request for true? Um, the next thing that is on the, oh, sorry, um, there is a site called securityheaders.com, which you can plug in any domain name into, and it will give you a report and a grading on that site, and I encourage you Grab your phone if you want to, plug in the website or website or sites that you're responsible for and have a look. And you don't have to tell anyone the score, you can keep it to yourself. Um, but it will give you, this site will give you really, really great guidance on, okay, you're missing these headers. Here's why you should have them. Here's more information about how you should implement them. So highly recommend checking that out. And the next thing, which is gonna feel like a no brainer, and surely everyone's patching everything all the time, but in my experience, no. Um, there is a security release for Drupal every month, more or less. Um, it's, it, it is a timed thing every month. There may not necessarily be something every month, but there generally is. Um, there are also security <laughs> patches for modules. And I tend to find that things either fall into one or two camps, or three, really. The third being everyone's patching, which is fantastic. Um, the second is the agency or, or contractor or consultant that takes care of the site isn't able to convince the customer that they should be paying for the time required to do the patching. So patching comes about when there's a security vulnerability and everybody's panicking. Or uh, patching comes about only, like there is a conscious effort that we will patch our website, but that update doesn't really apply to us. We'll wait and see what happens next month. Next month comes around, 
that update doesn't really apply to us either. We'll just keep waiting until there's one that applies to us. And then six months later, there's a massive vulnerability, everyone's exposed, and you've got six months of patches to apply, and one of them breaks your site. So what should have been a 20 minute patch cycle turns into two, three, four, five days. And for that entire period of time, that site is exposed. So very strongly encourage non-technical decision makers to be talking to their team about how often they patch, uh, how automated those patches are, um, and if they're patching not just the Drupal core, but also the Drupal modules that they're using as well. Patching should be boring, it should be routine, so that when you really have to do it in a hurry, there's no surprises. Um, the next thing that we should be looking at is content delivery networks. This is an area that used to be very, very expensive. Content delivery networks or CDNs are a distributed network of servers that receive requests on behalf of your web servers. And if they have a locally cached copy, they will deliver it. So if uh, users in Prague, for example, um, and they request content in something that we host and there's a CDN node near them, they'll get a copy of that content closer to them. It has a lot of benefits. The first being that it significantly reduces the load on your web server, which will help you reduce your hosting costs. I'm not terribly excited about that, but it's something that clients like. Um, the next is, uh, if there is an attack, a denial of service attack on your website, that network is going to absorb most of that attack, depending on the type of attack. So a CDN, generally you can get for free. I've got a little bit of an analysis here on four of the largest providers, being Cloudflare, Fastly, AWS's CloudFront, and Azure's CDN product. Um, they have varying degrees of complexity, but there are many, many more choices than this. This is a very commoditized, um, product offering, which is great for anyone who's delivering a website because most of you can get a CDN for nothing or for very, very little relative to the cost of your actual hosting and the cost that you spend maintaining the site every month. Um, the next thing on the list of things that are free and easy to do is two-factor authentication. I see very, very few sites with two-factor authentication. Most, if not all, users are now really familiar with two-factor auth. They've got it in their phones. They've got it on their company accounts. They've got it pretty much everywhere. So the learning curve is gone. Um, and two-factor authentication is probably the most silver bullet of all things that you could find when it came to preventing an attack on your website. If somebody gets the username and password for one of your users, it's a whole other kettle of fish to get the two-factor authentication code. Can be done, can be bypassed. However, two-factor auth with Drupal, there's a few different modules that do it. They do it in different ways. You can find the one that fits you best. They are free, they are easy. So you should be asking your team, do we have two-factor authentication on our websites? Um, the last thing in terms of free and easy, which is another thing that we don't see often enough, is email security records. Um, this is probably the slide that I had the hardest difficulty with not getting too technical. But if you think back to the security headers and the fact that they instruct browsers what to do, when they access your site, security email, sorry, email security records do the same thing but between mail servers. They tell mail servers how to be sure that someone that's pretending to send email as you is actually you, is from a server that you trust. And even more importantly, or just as importantly, what to do if they get an email that is pretending and fails that test. You effectively want to know if someone's trying to send phishing attempts as you, um, and the DMARC record is a way to do that. And finally, the empty ASTS record there will tell mail servers how to interact with your mail servers using SSL so that you encrypt connections over email. Um, again, this is something that we see very, very rarely. All this stuff is free. Um, it's somewhat more complicated to implement, but not very difficult at all. Um, and certainly something that whoever takes care of your domain name and your email, you should be talking to about this. Um, so that's it for the the, the quick and easy stuff. And if you went through and you implemented all of those things, I think you would have a more secure Drupal site than probably 80% of the Drupal installations that I've ever seen. Um, and all that stuff is free, except maybe the CDN. Um, the next stuff we're gonna talk about is the worthwhile endeavors. If you've done all of that stuff and you're in a really good place and you wanna think about, okay, I'm, I'm more exposed than most applications or I'm more worried about risk than most people, what are the next things that I can do? As an add-on to your content delivery network that you've gone and successfully deployed, you can look at a web application firewall. It works similarly to the CDN in that it receives requests from all over the world. 
and it analyzes them before it sends them onto your web server and it looks for malicious patterns in those requests. It can be programmed to be aware of specific Drupal security threats when major Drupal vulnerabilities have come out in the past. A lot of the CDN slash WAF providers have put in rule sets even before the Drupal patch is available or just as it's available. So that even if you haven't patched your site, if you're behind this web application firewall or this WAF, you've got a lot of that protection and a lot of that control. So we should be asking our team, do we have a WAF? Are we programming specific rules that are unique to our organization and our own risks? Um, and do we monitor WAF alerts? If something is attacking us, are we going to know about it? Um, the next thing, and I promise this is not a plug, um, <laughs> or at least it's a, it's a generic plug for everybody. The next thing is specialist Drupal hosting. Uh, in six years working with Drupal, I have seen seven websites or seven <laughs> servers that have been hacked. Um, and they've all been either self-hosted or hosted by a provider that wasn't a Drupal specialist. It's very, very, very easy to host a Drupal website. And that's part of the wonder of Drupal, but that's also part of the risk of Drupal because it's very easy to think, right, I've got a Drupal server, my site's being hosted, everything's okay, I'll walk away. But there are specific nuances to the implementation that you need to be aware of. Um, and I would encourage you to ask your team, does our host actually understand Drupal? And if we have major exploits or if we have problems with scale, can our host help us do that? Um, if you're looking for something that's a bit more turnkey and a bit uh, easier to access, especially on a tight budget, then platform.sh and Pantheon have very, very good products at that price point. Um, they're very powerful tools, um, and I would certainly recommend them. And if you're looking for something more specialized, especially if you're looking for something that's compliant with federal government frameworks like the ISM, then Amazi, Einstar, and Acquia are also very, very good choices. But GovCMS. Mm -hmm. Sorry, and GovCMS. <laughs> yes. But I kind of figured everyone here is already familiar with that. Um, but if you're, if you're self-hosting or you're hosting with someone who isn't a Drupal specialist, you need to be asking them those questions. Are you equipped to take care of Drupal? Um, the next thing along the line in, in terms of uh, medium effort stuff is single sign-on. I'm going to go out on a limb here and bet that everybody in this room has authentication to their workplace using something like Azure AD or Okta or Google Workspace or something like that, almost certainly Azure AD. Um, but if you have more than one user and more than one Drupal site, single sign-on is something that you should definitely be talking to your teams about. Um, if I, I see a lot of sites where someone's rolled onto a project, worked on it for a few months, rolled off the project, maybe even left the organization, but no one has an awareness of who has access to what and how tightly controlled their access is. They may have admin rights when they're just a content editor. Um, and this can go on for months or years. If that person's username and password, that they reused for the Drupal site gets leaked from another database, suddenly you're exposed and you wouldn't even know about it. Single sign-on is a really easy way to give people access to sites and remove it. Um, and generally, if somebody leaves an organization, you know about it in, like you're at least removing their main login for their email. So you should be picking back on that authentication process. Um, slightly more effort to configure. Cost depends on whether or not you've already got a single sign-on framework like Azure AD or Okta. If you do, then the cost should be effectively nothing aside from a couple of days set off. Um, and then finally, we'll talk about a couple of things that you can do uh, to build a culture that's focused on security. So you've done the stuff that's really, really easy. You've done the stuff that's a little bit difficult and costs a little bit of money. Where do you go from there? Um, and the answer to that is far more complicated than I'll go into here, because there is probably a hundred things that you can do to, to build a enterprise grade, government grade, very, very high security website. Um, but I want to talk about a few things really quickly. And the first is automated security scans. Um, if you're if you've built and deployed a Drupal website that is secure today, it may not necessarily be secure in three months or six months. There may be a component that you're using in your website or even a dependency in your website that has a dependency that has a dependency that has a dependency that becomes vulnerable at some point in six months time. And if you're not automatically patching that stuff and you're not monitoring that stuff, you won't know that that vulnerability exists in your site. So one thing that you can talk to your team about doing is setting up 
a daily automated security scan that audits your code base for known vulnerabilities. Um, I've got an example here. I didn't have a Drupal app that I could use as an example, but this is a Node.js app. Um, and this is static application security scanning from GitLab, GitHub, and pretty much everybody has something in this space. Um, but this will look at dependencies and find vulnerabilities in your code and let you know about it. And you can set this up so that it runs daily and you can get an alert that tells you, hey, that site that was perfectly fine yesterday isn't okay anymore and you need to look into it. The other option, uh, or the additional option, I should say, is dynamic application security scanning, which will log into your website. Instead of an analy analyzing your code and analyzes it when it's live in runtime, will log in, it will scan around. I'm not aware of anything yet that's very Drupal aware um, in terms of testing specifically for Drupal runtime vulnerabilities. But there are a lot, like Intruder.io that I've used here, that have a PHP awareness, so there's still a lot of value there. Um, so that's another area that's really worth looking at. Um, so we should be asking our theme. Are we scanning our code for vulnerabilities? Um, how does that scanning take place? And again, how do we get notified if it picks something up? Are we going to be aware of it? Um, the next thing along the list is workstation security. This is one that we've just gone through a very, very, very long process with. Um, and we are still going through the process with. It's, I think it's more difficult than server security, but it's also often overlooked. If you read about a data spill, uh, someone, an organization has a list of their customers exposed or a copy of their database exposed, very, very often in those stories, you'll hear about a laptop that was left behind somewhere, wasn't secured and just had a copy of the production database. So this slide and the next one, address that. Um, the first is workstation security, making sure that all your users have Encryption turned on, making sure all your users uh, connect through a secure net, uh, secure VPN, all your users have antivirus, all that sort of stuff um, is a lot of work. But if you've got secure servers, the next thing you need to be looking at is secure workstations. Um, and finally, sanitization of database exports. This isn't, this is free. So it doesn't really fit in this part of the discussion, but it's something that I think has slightly less value compared to the stuff that came earlier. Um, I wouldn't have this before I had the other stuff, to put it that way. Um, but you can set up scripts that will, when a developer copies their production database to their workstation or to another environment, it will scramble the user data um, that is copied, things like emails, usernames, everything else, so that if that database was stolen from that employee's laptop or lost somewhere else, the data is effectively useless. Um, might be slightly useful to a competitor, but to someone who's just looking to data mine personal information, it's pointless. Um, so that is a free tool that is well worth looking into. Um, so uh, a quick summary. Again, if you don't have everything here that is effort minimal, then I would suggest that's the very first thing you should be looking at. It won't cost you very much at all, if anything. Um, and then you can work further down that list to just gradually improve the security of your site over time. Security is something that you must evolve with. A site that is secure today will not necessarily be secure a year from now. Um, and that's not a Drupal thing. That's We all know that that's, that's technology and that's software. And all CMSs evolve like that. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, if anyone has any questions, I'll take it. Otherwise, I did mention I'm, I'm doing this talk at Prague. If you can't see that, which I wouldn't blame you if you can't. Um, <laughs> Einstar.io slash GCISS is a survey for this presentation. It's enormous. I would love any feedback you have, whether or not you're a technical person or a non-technical person. I appreciate this may not have been terribly exciting for 90% <laughs> of the room. But again, you guys do have to go through this whole, this, this same thing of, providing technical recommendations to non-technical decision makers. So if you feel like there's more that can be done here to make this more effective for that room in Prague that's hopefully going to be a far less technical audience, then please let me know. Otherwise, thank you very much. Question? Hello, Juan. Uh, how do you go about convincing people that they need to do patching regularly? Because that's a common problem, right? Yeah. Mate, if I knew the answer, I, <laughs> it's it's a very hard sell, um, especially to the audience that is, we'll patch when we need to, we'll patch when it's relevant. Um, and that is so far only something, it's only a lesson that I've learned 
but I've seen learned the hard way where there is that critical patch and it can't go out for a few days and okay, well, that's pretty bad. Um, but I think it's, again, if it's easy and it's done routinely, it's not a challenge to sell it in. So mm -hmm. I would talk about automation um, and I would talk about getting a routine for it and doing it, mm -hmm. you know, to that routine and never breaking that rule. Like it's easy when we get them sort of in a managed service or, or similar. Yes. Because, I mean, they pay for it, right? So it's yeah. easy, but. I think everyone has that problem. Yeah. Everyone I work with definitely no, has that I problem. Know problem is, yeah. I talk about it in terms of insurance. Yes. So it's like if you insure your car and you insure your house, patching is insuring your service or your website or your whatever it is. Yeah. And the same way that you, well, hopefully you wouldn't drive away without insuring your car, you should do the same thing to your website. Right. That's how I can meet people. <laughs> Um, we have a raised hand on meat. Let's see if I can work that out. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, my name is Joseph. I'm from uh, Department of Finance. I'm a actual developer. And uh, thank you for your presentation. I think this is a really awesome and a really good to uh, pass the Drupal security to the community. So uh, one quick thought is that uh, regarding to the non-tech person, uh, from my past experience, it's like personally, I strongly recommend that uh, sort of like a Drupal uh, advisory team or a Drupal security advisory catch-up can be happened weekly. Uh, as we know that Drupal uh, team has a calendar, basically has a routine release of Drupal core security updates and Drupal uh, country module security updates in the a, in a, in a, in a calendar. So that uh, I think uh, I strongly recommend that the non-tech person has a like a routine catch up with the technical person because we do understand that there's a gap there, right? So maybe the, the technical person like developer, we, oh, we all know that tomorrow we are going to have a critical something uh, Drupal uh, like the uh, uh, module needs to be updated. However, we need to uh, like uh, put it into a catch up with the non-tech person and present such information in a non-tech way mm -hmm. so that this communication can be smooth this and then we can put this uh, for example, like the uh, uh, Drupal uh, security updates happened, and the non-tech person can and understand us. Uh, so this is my point. Thank you, sir. That's a really great point. Did everyone did everyone hear that? Okay. Yeah. yeah great. Okay. Yeah, that is a really really good point. Um, time the security meeting to the Drupal security advisories, um, and then you've got a lot of extra context for the conversation. Thank you. Any other questions? I will be interested um, what tools, if you say tools to use for sanitize the database, mm. uh, what kind of tools you use? Just the uh, the Drush sanitize command or SQL sanitize command. It's built oh, into okay. Drush, so you can, you can, and you can program it to be a bit more aware of your specific data structure right. and the columns that you want it to, to scramble when it does an export. Okay. So it's all, yeah, it's all just built into Drush. I don't know if there's other tools that do it or other ways to do it, but that's the one I'm familiar MTK with. MTK sort of thing? Yes. <laughs> MTK? On Skipper, where you can uh, users customize what they want to sanitize. OK. Cool. It's really cool. Is that me? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, we'll take like, like five minutes. You can all get some refreshments, stretch your legs, and then, uh, and then we'll hear from Nathan, who's going to give us an update on GovCMS. So yeah, we'll be back at, uh, let's say 7.10, Nathan, is that all right? All right, fantastic. Thanks, everyone.